Good morning, Terra Nova. Uh, we're gathered here on Sunday to center back on the worship of Christ and the Word of God. We've been going through a series called The People of God. It's a, a walk through the entire Bible narrative to understand who God is through how he deals with the people of God. It's, it's examining the great story arc of the Word of God. And we're in a section called the epistles, the letters that are written. Last week, we talked about Peter the man, how his life was shaped by the faithfulness of God. He was a man who didn't have confidence at all in the calling that God had for him. He was a man who, when he was following, was impetuous to the point of folly at times. And ultimately, it was revealed that he had such a self-protective heart that he could never risk loving the things Jesus loved in the way that Jesus loved those, namely the people of God, the church. However, God's unshakable faithfulness changed all of that. He called Peter made it clear that he wanted Peter, regardless of how Peter saw his own past and his own personal qualifications. He taught Peter to submit his will to the will of God. When, when Peter thought it was a horrible idea for Jesus to be crucified, Jesus was able to tell him that this is actually God's plan. And Peter learned how to submit his will to God's will. And finally, God taught him through his great moment of sin and failure, through the restoration after that, how God would change his heart. This week, I want to focus on Peter's messages. We're going to look at 1st and 2nd Peter. So if you have a Bible, please turn to 1st Peter in your Bible. If you don't, simply put your hand up and somebody will bring you one. We're going to look at um, the, the, these two letters together in conjunction, and here's the roadmap for today. First, we'll, we'll talk about that God has made saints. Peter's very clear to give God the credit, God the initiation, and God ultimately all the glory for what has happened in the lives of those people that he now writes to from this position as a, a saintly older pastor. Secondly, we'll look at the lives of saints both in the word and in the world today. And then finally, we'll look at how Peter attaches such a weight to what's going to happen, to the future, to what's going to be revealed in Christ, that it becomes almost a strange thing. It's an anchor to the future that he tells us to dig deeply upon. Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. I'll read verses 1 through 12. We'll pray and then continue in the word. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced. So to you, through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which the angels long to look. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we ask as you open the hearts of people, as we turn our hearts to your word, that your spirit who authored it, your spirit who brings conviction, comfort, and encouragement within our inner man and woman would be active today, that we would be yielding submissively to what you have, 
that those who do not know Jesus would come to know him, and that those who know him would come to love him more greatly, and that those who love him would be yielded to his service more purely. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his greater glory. Amen. So we're going to talk first about God's plan, but let, let's, let's look a little bit at the letters and how they can work together. If you take these two letters as a whole, the two books that Peter wrote in the New Testament, his only writings, they're really not that distinct. They sync up pretty well. They're written over a very similar period. First Peter's written somewhere from 62 to 64, and the, the latter book is written sometime after 64, but before 68 AD, because that's when Peter will be crucified and martyred in Rome. He's writing from Rome even from his first epistle. First Peter 5.13 says, She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Who is the she who is at Babylon? Well, it, it, it's the church. The, the New Living Translation puts it this way. Your sister church here in Babylon sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. But Babylon was, was not the, the Chaldean city, not the Babylonian city, not the, the modern Iraqi cities that we would think of today as Babylon. He, he's using Babylon as sort of a, a dog whistle, a code for those who would be in the know. And at this point, Babylon to them is Rome. He's equating Babylon with, with the... Uh, people of Babylon who oppressed Israel during, during their time when they were sojourners, where they were aliens, when they were outside the land. And so now he addresses this group as aliens, but rather than saying something that could be very dangerous for him, Rome, he says, the church who is here at Babylon. The old shepherd in Rome seems to know that his death is near. He seems to be aware, but his focus is no longer, how do I just preserve for myself anything I can in this world? He's focused on giving these messages to the church. In the second epistle, he, he makes it pretty clear that he's aware that his death is coming very soon. He says, therefore, in 2 Peter 1, 12 through 25, I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right, as long as I am in the body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that my departure, after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall those things. He has the heart of the Peter who was changed by Jesus. He's no longer about protecting himself. He's accepted his own temporal nature in this world. He sees a greater life where suffering precedes a glory that will come, and he's concerned about shepherding those so that when he leaves, when his time in this world is over and more goes on, they're still cared for. Th these letters that exist on the other side of that restoration really show the heart that Jesus changed in Peter. If you remember last week, the big failure Peter had was denying the Lord at the time of his great suffering. He denied Jesus three times, as was prophesied. And then when Jesus restores him, the, the question of restoration isn't, Peter, are you going to have the courage to keep your promises? Peter, are you going to have the data to be able to say the right things about me? It's, Peter, will your heart love the sheep? If you love me, you have to love the object of my love, my church, and be one who feeds them, who pastors them, who shepherds them. And, and, and now he's doing that. And, and he says, I'm just going to be reminding you of things that you're established in, stirring you up by way of remembrance. So much of what we need to know as Christians is foundational. It's like the coach who focuses on blocking and tackling, even though these kids have been playing for years, he knows the foundations or what everything else is built upon. Our salvation can sometimes get us comfortable with these great things the movements of the God of heaven on behalf of mankind to save us. And, and yet we don't want to get over that. So Peter tells us, man, we need to be reminded of this constantly. Here, here's how he begins this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who did all these things according to his great mercy. This thought, these discussions, these matters can't be just of the head. They have to penetrate the heart. That, that's why Peter begins with this almost shout of praise. Blessed be the God and Father. Praise God who did these things. They're no longer just correct statements like Peter made in Matthew 16 when he said, you're the Christ, the son of the living of God. They, they now come with this great heart of passion to worship this truth that's revealed. The, the glory is all God. Peter lays that out clearly. He says that God caused us to be born again. You, you had no choice in the first birth. 
when your parents found that the um, nothing good was on television that night and you were conceived, you had no choice in that matter. You were born with the genes that you were born with because of them. You didn't choose where you were born. All these things were brought about because of someone else. And now Peter's saying that your spiritual rebirth, the life that will unite you with God forever, was not by your choice, but God caused you to be born a second time. He chose you in Christ. It it can't be missed. Peter's statement that this is the Christ, the anointed one in Matthew 16, is true, but now he wants us to focus so much more on this is how much God loves us, that he provided the Christ. And central to his theology in both letters is Jesus, who he'll call the shepherd of your souls. He's realized the importance of loving and caring for the sheep. He says this in 1 Peter 3-5, through according to his great mercy, he caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And, and that resurrection really was the emphasis of apostolic preaching. They, they believed in the crucifixion and understood there was a sacrifice for sin that was made, but that's not what they saw as the end piece. The initiation of the Messianic age happened at the resurrection, the, the, the payment, if you will, the clearing of the check that was promised, the payment for penalty of sin on the cross is the resurrection. In 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21, Peter will write this, knowing you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Just as when Jesus entered time, the miracle of God entering the world was hidden in the womb. So too, in the resurrection, hidden in the tomb, is heaven bringing us into the life of Christ. Our faith rests in God. There's a trust of what God has revealed and what he's done. It, It looks to the past and says, I have a confidence because Jesus died for me. Our hope, well, that rests in the future our faith, and our hope. It's a trust on on not just what God has done and what God has said, but what he has said he will do, and our equal confidence that he'll do this, that this is what makes you his, a faith in his word, his plan, and his provisions in Jesus. And Peter's careful to take the time to assure us that it's based on the word of God, and that's why he trusts it. See, The scriptures call God, God who cannot lie. If he did, he wouldn't be perfectly holy anymore. Lying is the language of Satan. He's called a liar and the father of lies. It's his fluent, natural tongue. And we picked it up the moment we started to believe in his lies. We heard the accent and dialect and began to imitate it ourselves, but not so with God. The truth is his only language, and it comes with all the power that he generates behind what is true. It it changes things. It takes the things that are not and speaks them into existence, whether it was the creation in Genesis or the new life brought to you. Where a lie made us sinners, faith in the truth has turned those sinners into saints. And we become saints who are in this world and must stay, therefore, in the word. See, the, the, the word says that we've become his. We've become adopted as children. But, but Peter also emphasizes a change in us, not just the change of our status. In his second epistle, chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, he says this, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. We've been seeded, he'll say, by the living word of God. We become, therefore, partakers of the divine nature, not just adopted as sons and daughters, but but now seeded as sons and daughters, conforming, changing who we are, It's almost like a spiritual DNA transplant that just takes and continues to grow as Christ lives in us. 
it's like lawn care time when you have sort of the, the crappy lawn, you dig it up and thatch it and, and you overseed it, right? And the hope is that this new seed will continue to grow in both the bald spots and also choke out the weeds. This salvation is like that, that we become partakers of the divine nature. And with the presence and power of the Spirit as we seek him and follow him through the word, we become more like Jesus. The, the temporal things are like those weeds and blank spots. And we're both temporal and tainted as sinners. But we become something else, something permanent. First Peter 1, 23 through 25. Since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all the glory like the flowers of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. It, it's a lot of work to, to see God change us over time, to, to yield ourselves to the word. It demands that we're in the word. It, it demands that we're, we're struggling to have faith, that we're working together with God who works within us to do and will his good pleasure. Peter recognizes its work, though. In his second letter, chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the assurance that Peter lays out for us from the word of God, that it's work but we can follow these things to see change. Where he'll talk to the people about girding up their loins and setting their hope on Jesus. It's work, but they will see that change. It, it, it's the change that we begin to see as assurance of the salvation. It's easy to say, I believe these things, but it takes something else to see the change in people. Where we see ourselves now drawn to Jesus, like Peter was. We see ourselves now drawn to the word, and rightly seeing that the Word, inspired by the Spirit, brings us to Jesus again. And it brings about our own sanctification, all those progressive changes that make us more like Jesus, all those lists of things that he said will help to change us, knowledge about Jesus and self-control that we're not just carried away, and steadfastness that we're not just grabbing the latest things, and godliness, and then what Peter saw his changed life bring, brotherly affection, and brotherly affection ultimately bringing us to this place of love. Please note this. Peter's not saying this saves you if you do a lot of good things. He's already said it wasn't by money, it wasn't by sacrifice, it wasn't by Jewish tradition. He says this is not to save you, but it's to make your calling or election sure. In other words, to confirm it. Like, like reading the instructions so you use something right. You can know that you're actually in the process of transformation. And Peter will elevate this far above any other experiences. He's a Jesus guy from the Bible guy. It's not the mystical stuff. And he knows this. He experienced the mystical stuff. And in this last letter, he's going to talk to the people about it and show the superiority of the word of God. 2 Peter 1, 16 through 20. We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, 
but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. He lays out this view of the Bible. It's, it's the Holy Spirit's book. I, I know there are people who desire to see great works of the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you, the greatest work that we can know of the Holy Spirit is the Scripture. Through that, we can encounter him and see Jesus revealed. Through that, we can actually find conviction of our sin. Through that, we can actually find a faith, faith that changes us into someone else, more human and more holy, seeing the image of God restored in us. If you really want to be a ch- person who chases the Holy Spirit, lean into the great work of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God. See, Peter's a person who got to see something mystical, miraculous, when he saw the Mount of Transfiguration. He remembers it. He didn't throw it away as nothing, but, but here's what he knows. It wasn't for everybody, it was him. See, sometimes we'll have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and I've seen this, where people will then want to go to other people and say, you need to do exactly this. If you just follow this handy-dandy formula of how the Spirit chose to interact with my life, it'll work for you. Not a promise the Spirit ever makes, but just taking something that happened to us and wanting that for other people so much that we impose it on them. But Peter says, you know, that, that was for me. It's also subject to memory and interpretation. Maybe where Peter stood, it looked one way, but prophecy, he says, this was never by anyone's interpretation privately. It's what the Spirit says. The Word of God is greater. It's for everyone. It's for you. It's for me. It's for Peter. And it's written by one, the Holy Spirit. So we're assured of this confidence when using the Bible rightly that it tells believers in Jesus who love him, we can know him more and more deeply though we do not see him through the Word. Those who come to know him more and more will find that their life is not just about the things of heaven and salvation in the Spirit. That the Bible actually says a lot about very practical things, the small bits of life that make life. The Bible says a lot about money and finances, a lot about marriage and sex and children. The Bible says a lot about work and government. So saints in the world, word will find out how to be saints in the world. He doesn't write a book just on prayers, heaven, and religious practice, but a book that gives us all things required for life and godliness, Peter will say. It's a life that is redefined by submission to Jesus, so it makes every other submission related to that and under that. And Peter will talk about saintly submission as saints in the world, that we go into our workplaces, we walk into our homes, we walk into the neighborhoods honoring God because we're submitting to him there. It's kind of encapsulated in 1 Peter 2.17. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood, the church. Fear God and honor the emperor. My dad was always fond of adages and how wisdom could be captured in a few phrases, and he would repeat those now and again to me. And they're a treasure to me. I still think back on a lot of them. I remember one Christmas he he told me, um, Edward, you need to respect everyone and fear no one. Now, he was just talking about people. The only one Peter has fear for in here is the fear of God. And and that word honor was like my dad's word respect. Respect everyone. Respect the emperor. Something different for the church. Within the church, it's defined by love. Jesus loves these people we follow after in that same love and a fear for God. But that place of honor. Honor everyone. Where's your challenge in that? Who are the people that you find it easier to judge than honor? Easier to condemn than to commiserate with? easier to hold it at arm's length than to hug closely. Who are the people that you just can't seem to honor? A lot of times, it's a judgment that we impose on them. Peter has already said, if we've forgotten that we were cleansed from our sins, we're like a terribly nearsighted person who can't see what's happened to them anymore. Because if we condemn people who are under the same judgment we are, we're, we're hypocrites. See, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, St. Paul will give us some insight into what the person who's not a believer is suffering from. He says, blinded by the devil, they have lost their sense of who they are. The unbeliever is blinded by the God of this world. See, the image of God puts us all in the same uniform. The the, the call for God's mission to bring salvation to the world puts everyone in that same cause. It's, It's what God wants. He desires the restoration of people. If you find someone in the same uniform as you, if you were in the service, let's say, and there's an enemy out there. And, and you find the enemy has people in your uniform with blindfolds on. Do you shoot them? No. They're, they're prisoners. You, they're still yours. They're just imprisoned. Th- this is how we, we need to honor those people who, who aren't believers, who don't know, who are in the image of God, 
who Jesus died for. We need to treat them as those who are blinded by the Satan of this world and not just those who are enemies. It's difficult in this world because it's not just dealing with other people and their non-belief. It's dealing with the sins of this collective world, including our own against ourselves, and there's just so much potential for trouble after the fall. But no surprise, Jesus told his disciples this. In John 16, 33, he said, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Paul promised the problems that would come. All those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Peter focuses on and in some ways prepares and feeds the sheep to strengthen them about the suffering that's coming. 1 Peter 4, 12-16, Beloved, do not be surprised by the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. See, sometimes we're going to suffer for what other people do to us. Sometimes just normal evil, sometimes particularly because you're a believer in Jesus. Sometimes it's your own sin. Peter says avoid those, don't suffer because you're breaking commandments, you're disobeying, like being a murderer or thief, trying to live the life that you were once saved from. But he says sometimes there's a suffering that comes upon us that God will actually use to follow that same formula for Jesus where suffering precedes glory, where we can rejoice because we're following that same path, taking part in those sufferings. And we'll understand that for Jesus, a cross preceded the crown. And we will one day see him fully revealed in glory. And that's that final place, that anchor in the future. What tethers you in the storms of life? I mean, things are bad. The money, well, that eventually goes. The, the things, they become obsolete. Even the people, even ourselves, we just become less and less in this world, dying on one level in the outer man, though renewed in the inner. And junkyards and graveyards tell us all the time, one sermon, that stuff isn't going to save you because it's temporal too. It's not going to last. But to know faith in God, what he has said he would do and has done in the past, is to know hope in God, what he has said he will do and will do in the future. It, it's to know a future that we can anchor to. In, in a world where we await full salvation, in a world where we struggle with the sins of others, our own sin, and even persecution of being Christian, Peter tells us to anchor on that future. He calls it an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It won't ruin, it won't become tainted, it won't become less. It's worth as much to you as it was to Peter, if you understand it, that it's kept for you in heaven by God's power. He tells us to anchor in that future that will be revealed in the last time. This man who's about to lose his life in this world, who, who at another time when he feared that so much, he would do anything to keep it, now is actually speaking to us and saying, don't, don't be so afraid. Don't be so afraid if you get the disease that they don't have a pill for. You're going to die, actually. Anchor on the future that's coming and be able to see the glory revealed. And he tells them, preparing your minds for action in chapter 1, verse 13 of 1 Peter. Being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus. Girding your minds, it's that picture of how people worked in the ancient Near East, the men and the women both kind of wore dresses, and it was hard to work in a dress, so you would take the, the bottom of it and pull it back through the top and tuck it in so you were no longer a worker in a dress, you were basically a worker in a diaper, and it was a whole lot easier to get things done. But it meant you were intentionally preparing yourself for work. That's what the Christian needs to do, Peter's saying. Look, it's gonna be distracting at times, prepare yourself. You're always gonna have something else to work on, prepare yourself. It's going to take focus. Prepare yourself to set your sober mind, clear thinking, not on the temporal things that will be taken away, but on eternity. It, it means we celebrate what Christ has done for us on the cross, but we fix our hope on what will happen at his return. 
It, it takes our eyes off the world a little bit when we consider eternity, when we live with the end in mind. In his second letter, in chapter 3, verse 8 and following, he'll write this. Do not overlook this one fact. Beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The, the Lord's not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come, like a thief, and then the heavens, the sky that you know, will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies, the planets and stars, will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. It's the last lines of his last letter, and he ends where he began. The promises of the Lord are true. Don't agonize over the timetable. It'll come like a thief. The time that you don't expect it when you're not ready, when you're not prepared, it will come upon you. Don't worry just about the small things of this world, the temporal things. He emphasizes twice repeating it. These things won't last. And, and he does what I think good pastors do. He asks the question. It's sort of the moment, like when I do this, I try to sometimes step away from the pulpit a little bit and say, so what do you, what do you think about this? What do you, what do, you do here? And in verse 11, he steps out and says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? How do you live knowing some things will not last and some things will have eternal impact? This is all part of God's plan. And he says, don't despair over the world, over its sufferings, over its false teachings, even over the injustices against you. All of that will be cleaned and a new world where only righteousness dwells will make it right. Rather, Peter says, stay holy, which really means staying close to Jesus, and stay patient, not getting carried away like a ship with no anchor, but anchored fully in that future. Focus on living holy, living patiently, both of which he ties to Jesus. In his first letter, he says, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense of anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you, Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame, for it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. And all of this, all this work and focus, it screams process. Even Peter's last line, before he says that Jesus will return and pronounces that he gets all the glory, amen, that, that penultimate, that second to last uh, f uh, uh, phrase in their sentence in that whole letter is grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If I could say something pastorally, especially to those who are younger, be patient. God has a lot of work. You'll see such immediate change when you come to Christ, but it's not always going to be that fast and noticeable of a change. And, and, and if you're not patient with yourself, you're not going to be standing where Jesus wants you to because he wants you waiting on him in his timeline patiently. Peter just said that. But you're also going to be really unkind to yourself, probably worse to yourself than you are to anyone else. You'll just hold up your failures with this, this sick pride that says, I, I'm just letting God down. He can't do anything to me because through me because I'm, I'm just the worst. I, I'd encourage you, be patient with yourself. God has it. Keep focused on him. But don't hate your failures to the point where all you want is perfection. Love what God's challenging with. Rejoice in the fiery trials, like Peter said. 
Be glad that he's actually changing you. He covers all of it. He has it all. We'll get all the glory. That's the word Paul uses. It's, it's a translation of the Greek of a Hebrew word that means weightiness, heaviness. The thing that becomes so dense and so matter-filled that it begins to pull other things into its orbit. Continue to give glory, add weight to Jesus and all that he has done and also all he will do. Both now, Peter breaks it up, and secondly, into eternity. Peter, the changed man, brings a Christ-centered, word-centered sanctification process to us through his two letters. That's what the pastor of the Bible speaks to us today. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we ask that you would help us to think clearly, God, that where this world has become too large, too important, too valuable, you would help us to see what passes and what remains, that you would help us to stand in Christ as your chosen people, elect exiles who don't root to call this place home and try to make it perfect, but live here to serve until you are revealed and we can know the great grace of not just being saved and seeing the beginning seeds of change, but knowing what it is to see you fully revealed and to be changed fully into your likeness. Lord, we worship and give you glory because of the plan and provisions in Christ you've given to your church. We thank you for your servant Peter who shared these words with us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.